morning. Welcome to Bethel Cumberland Presbyterian Church in Sango, Tennessee. I do have some announcements this morning before we have our uh, call to worship and we begin. Uh, first of all, uh, on June 6th, the session met on Thursday night and I charged them with the task of uh, deciding what we're going to do going forward with masks and etc. Uh, so they decided that on June 6th, Sunday, June 6th, that uh, masks um, at our worship services, at all of our events, uh, would be optional as of June 6th. Um, we're going to also, on June 6th, on that day, reopen Sunday school during that time. And I encourage you to please come. And also, we're going to have our fellowship uh, start back up on June 6th. Uh, fellowship is defined by uh, coffee, donuts, and conversation. Uh, we do that at 9.30. So I invite you to all three of those events. And I am looking forward to uh, having mask as optional. Uh, and I will tell you that if I was out there instead of up here, I would probably continue to wear my mask. But as I looked around the congregation the other day, I would say 90 to 95 percent plus of our people have all received their two shots. So I think we're in pretty good shape to take that step. Also, on the 30th, next Sunday, that's Memorial Day service Sunday, and I'm going to honor our graduates uh, on that day. So if you know of some, I have a few people to call, but if you know of someone that I may not be aware of that is graduating from high school or from college, and we can invite them, and I can include them in our uh, graduate recognition, that's next Sunday the 30th. And then on the 13th of June, since we missed last year, the Ed Porter and Ernie DeWald Hawaiian Shirt Day. We missed that last year. And so I've decided that on the 13th of June, we're going to have the Ed Porter and Ernie DeWald Hawaiian Shirt Day. <laughs> and the ladies are included in that. I invite you to wear a on a, a Hawaiian scarf or a Hawaiian dress or whatever you think is appropriate. As a matter of fact, I just bought a new Hawaiian shirt at an estate sale at a magnificent discount uh, just for this occasion. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, it's going to be uh, a, a, a time of us reinventing ourselves and reestablishing events as we go forward. Um, but all of those are in the process in the next two to three weeks. Also, uh, Jeff says that he received permission from the session to purchase more mulch for our playground, which sees lots of action uh, every day after school as moms stop by with their children. Uh, and on June 5th, He's going to remulch. That is a Saturday, uh, June the 5th. And if you could bring tools, which would be shovels and rakes, I assume. Wheelbarrow. And a wheelbarrow, if you have one. I have one of those that I can bring, and someone can fill it up and empty it. And I'll, I'll supervise that, <laughs> that work. Uh, but if that day doesn't work, we'll shoot for June 12th. But right now it's June 5th to redo the mulch in the playground, and I appreciate Jeff taking charge uh, of that. Uh, at this time, I would like to invite uh, Stacy to provide a, a choral call to worship as I light the candles and we invite the light of Christ into our presence. Stacy. <laughs>
Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we have gathered together today, not just to be in your house, but to celebrate a great gift, possibly the greatest gift that you've ever given to your people and to the world, that being the gift of the Holy Spirit. Today, Heavenly Father, you can look around our sanctuary and see that people have participated in wearing red today, which we know, and we hope you are pleased with, it is the symbolic color of the gift of the Holy Spirit, the flames that were exhibited on that day. Heavenly Father, we will try our best to exemplify the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives as we praise you and we sing to you and, your t- and to your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our opening hymn today is number 262, one of my favorites, Holy, Holy, Holy. If you could please rise and Craig will direct us. I think we're going to do the first and last verse of 262. much. You may be seated. Our offertory sentence today comes from Psalm 16. Lord, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. My future is in your hands. Because of you, there are no boundary lines in my life. My existence is pure freedom leading to the most beautiful of all inheritances. I will follow the path that you have placed before me, holding your hand as I go. This morning, let us worship this mighty God with his mighty gifts, with our gifts to him.
Stacy sent me the list of hymns for today. I changed one. And uh, so I inserted our hymn of faith today. Morning has broken. That's number 60. And you may remain seated as we sing this. Because the very last words of the very last line that we're going to sing today infer that this is a new day. And it is especially in light of the blessing of Pentecost. So, Craig, if you would lead us, please, and the first and last verse is number 60, Morning Has Broken. talk about Pentecost being a new day every day. And we'll get to that as we read our scripture today. We have to read the story of Pentecost on Pentecost and hopefully it will refresh your soul as it does mine. Nina has a prayer card for us, a praise 
uh, thank you to all those who prayed for her and her uh, biopsy that she had on Tuesday, which showed clearly that she has no cancer. And Nina, we're very pleased for you. Thank you very much. Uh, Doug, uh, safe travel requests uh, for him Thursday through Saturday. He'll be out amongst the Englishmen traveling this land, and we pray that he will be okay during that travel, that God's mercies and God's protective angels will be him. And a praise that Sigrid is back with us today. Thank you very much for being here. And in, in light of that, I will let everyone know that uh, Bob is still receiving treatment and he is in the VA home here in Clarksville. And we're hoping that uh, their rehabilitation uh, wing, which they do a wonderful job, will be able to help him more. Carol Knight has given us a prayer card. She has a friend, uh, Winston Bash. Uh, waiting on a diagnosis, possibly liver cancer, which is always serious. And he could uh, certainly use our prayers. And so we will, we will keep Winston in our prayers. Thank you for letting us know about that, Carol. We appreciate it very much. And Beverly says that her uh, first cousin, Linda Richard Miller, Richardson Miller, um, her cancer has returned from remission, and it is wreaking havoc. And so we will keep Linda in our prayers also. Um, we issue prayers this morning for all those that are graduating, uh, whether, you know, sometimes we even celebrate those who graduate from elementary or middle school, but it is a big day for them, but high school and college especially. Uh, and I ask that you keep them in your prayers because there's a great time of turmoil in their lives that they're trying to decipher and determine where they're headed with their lives. Uh, Sigrid, would you like to share with us this morning? Thank you. Uh, Absolutely. I'm much better now, but my husband needs a lot of prayers. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. And I got cards and, uh, and everything. I want to thank Barbara and the Linus for checking on me. You know, she, she's been very, you know, if she, does, if she doesn't do it one day, she does it on the next day. And it's been very much appreciated. Absolutely. Thank you very much. You're very welcome for the prayers. And be sure to let Bob know that we're still praying for him, okay? And for you as the caretaker. Are there others this morning? If not, let us go to God in prayers of gratitude. Mighty God, you heard the praises this morning that were issued. And those are praises of you, Heavenly Father. Beyond our limits, you have no limits. And we see your hand at work every single day in the lives of your children, in the lives of believers, and even in the lives of the non-believers that you are trying to convert for us and for your kingdom. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all the many blessings we, we, that we receive, but especially when our life is in turmoil and we turn to you and, and you always hear and you always act on our behalf. As the scripture tells us, out of the worst situation, God can make good things come. We believe that and we live that. In the name of your Son, Jesus, Amen. Okay, the uh, communal prayer this morning is our Lord's Prayer, and it is printed in your bulletin. I invite you to join with me, and we pray as we have been taught by our Savior. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, 
as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to go to your Heavenly Father in a moment of silent prayer, you and your Father. Lord God, it is an honor to be able to call you our Father because Jesus said he is my Father and he also said you are our Father and we honor you as we speak to you our silent prayers of concern and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading this morning, as I said, we have to uh, we have to read the story of Pentecost, and uh, diff- I kind of move it around a little bit and select different portions every year. But at Pentecost, we must. Uh, I appreciate everyone who uh, wore red today. Uh, God Himself provided us with beautiful red roses uh, in my garden. And Nancy picked them and arranged them this morning, and and they are just a sign, a symbol of the power and the might of God and his creating beauty in so many ways and in so many things. And and, uh, I thank the Lord and I thank Nancy for putting together his gift this morning for our altar, for uh, God's altar. I'm reading from the book of Acts today, and I have selected two parts, part one and part two. In the first part is chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, and the second part is chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. Let us read and listen for the word of God. I wrote the first narrative, or the first story, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up after he had given orders through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After he had suffered, meaning after he had died and he had been resurrected, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them about 40 days and speaking about God's kingdom. And while he was together with the disciples, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise. This, he said, is what you heard from me. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, at this time are you restoring the kingdom to Israel? Jesus, in his unending patience, said to them, It is not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and actually to the ends of the earth. And then on that blessed day, when, as Jesus and the Father promised, Pentecost came. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there was a sound like a violent rushing wind come from heaven. And it filled the whole house where they were staying. And tongues like flames of fire that were divided appeared to them and then rested on each one of them. 
Then they were all filled at that moment with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different languages as the Spirit gave them the power and the ability for that speech and that language. There were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, the multitude came together. They were drawn to the sound of the wind and was confused because each one of them from their own nation, they heard the disciples speaking in their own home language. And they were astounded and they were amazed saying, look, aren't all these who are speaking simply Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judea, Cappadocia, Ponta, Asia, Phryga, and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own language about the magnificent acts of God. And they were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, how could this be? But some naysayers sneered and said, these men are nearly full of new wine. They are drunk. But Peter stood up at that time and he raised his voice and he proclaimed to them, You Jewish men and all the residents of Jerusalem, let this be known to you and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk as you might suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. On the contrary, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he quoted Joel's prophecy. And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Then your sons and your daughters, they will prophesy, and the young men are going to see visions, and the old men are going to dream wonderful dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on male and female slaves in those days, and they're going to prophesy. I will display wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the great and remarkable day of the Lord comes. At that moment, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What a wonderful piece of scripture. We're going to try and put a little different spin on it this morning. As I was watching television in one of my moments of relaxation this week, There was a commercial, and you know, a lot of times, I don't know if you have this problem or not, but a lot of times when Nancy and I are watching TV, there will be a commercial, and it'll be entertaining, or it'll be really weird and out there, and at the end of the commercial, we go, what were they selling? What was that commercial about? I can't even tell you what this commercial was about, but at one point, there was a picture of a little boy, and he was sitting on the wooden steps in front of his house, and he was eating a popsicle. And as he was eating the popsicle, he dropped it, dropped the whole thing, stick and all, down onto the step, down there by his feet. And he looked at it, and he reached down, and he picked it up, and as little boys who want that popsicle or want to do, he went, (laughs) blew off the germs, and continued to eat it. It was like he, he blew it off and it, it's a new popsicle. It's okay. I'm going to eat this. This is something new and I'm not afraid of it at all. Well, I thought about that as I began exploring the scripture, the story, and the meaning of Pentecost. Pentecost is one of those times that 
truly in the church, we underestimate, under-celebrate the true meaning and value of Pentecost. We all wear red, and it, it just does my heart good to look out here and see this sea of red. I mention that every Pentecost. But we do that for a reason. We're supposed to be celebrating Pentecost. In the scripture that I read this morning in chapter 1, in verse 1, the author, the writer, says, I wrote to you, Theophilus, about the things that Jesus began to do. And that's very important. Because he's saying, because he is saying that, I already wrote one story, but that was just what? That was just the beginning. That was just the start. This is what Jesus put in place. He began his ministry. He began his teaching. It's just a start. And then he mentions the words of Jesus himself to the disciples. And he says that the Father's promise will be fulfilled. You will receive a gift of power. And I'm sure the disciples were somewhat mystified by that because lots of promises had been made and sometimes I think the disciples just weren't paying attention. And Jesus mentioned things over and over and over to try and get them zeroed in and get them focused. But he said, the Father's promise that I have told you about is coming. And of course they, in their night Naivety, naivety, whichever way you say it, um, responded, oh, so you're going to restore the kingdom and the nation of Israel. And as you heard me say, with great patience, Jesus responded in his own way, this is not about Israel. This is not about restoring the nation of Israel. This is not about Israel as a kingdom or Israel as a people. It's bigger than that. In actuality, and I don't mean this as a slight, but Israel's glory days with God had come and gone. He had given them opportunity upon opportunity upon opportunity to fulfill their destiny as God's people and they fell short many times and they fall short right here by saying, is this about the kingdom of Israel? Are you going to make us a great nation again? <sighs> that was not his intention at all. And he says, it's really not for you to know. You know, when you're teaching a class or something and you have different levels of students and and sometimes people are afraid to ask questions and someone will raise their hand and they'll say, well, well, I have a stupid question. And, and the person leading the class always goes, oh, there's no such thing as stupid questions. Well, that's being nice because as we see right here, stupid may not be the right word, but that was a stupid question about restoring the kingdom of Israel. Partially, mainly because... It's irrelevant. God's plan and his purpose is much bigger at this point. And we'll see it in the prophecy of Joel. It's about all humanity. It's not about you Jews and your proselytes, the people that have come to you. It's bigger than that. So we're going to let that stupid, irrelevant question go. And Jesus let it go. And tried to focus them on the idea that what your father has promised, your heavenly father, is coming. And it's because they were concerned about power. We're all concerned about power. Some of us are consumed with the idea of power. I'm going to give you some power. The ultimate power. They didn't see it yet. They didn't know the ultimate power of the Holy Spirit was to come to them. And you, even though you don't realize your place in this scheme yet, will be my witnesses to the world. 
And we see it at Pentecost. The world that Jesus referred to was the world as it was known then in that part of the world. The listing of all the Jewish men from all the nations, it says. And they ended up, just as Jesus said, witnessing to all of these men on the day of Pentecost. So part one is Jesus trying to set the stage so that they will be prepared for what is coming. The power, the burden of being a witness, the presence of God with them as they go down this trail. Well, when the day of reckoning comes, and it's referred to in the scripture as the day of Pentecost. Now, I've explained this before. It's not our Pentecost that he's writing about. This is our Pentecost, our celebration of the gift of the Holy Spirit. What they were all in Jerusalem celebrating was the Jewish day of Pentecost, which depending on who you listen to and who you believe, which one of the scholars, because their festivals tend to vary kind of on a scale as to what they mean. But for the Jewish community, it was kind of like, you know, when they came, they all came to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration. Well, they all came Jerusalem to Jerusalem for the Pentecost celebration, which clearly, in most people's mind, was when a celebration of when God gave them the law on the mountain. Moses, God, the people, the law, the celebration, and that's who they are. So their Pentecost was a celebration of that event, the giving of the law to the people and really to the world. So you have to be careful. But we're getting to our Pentecost and what it means. No, it's not the giving of the law. It has nothing to do with their exodus and their time in the desert with God and him, him giving them that gift to try and bring them together as a nation. You know, that was his goal. I'm going to make a great nation out of you people, one way or another. And he tried his hardest with those people. You know, I've mentioned before, I doubt many of you remember it because it's a theological, historical thing. You know, it's not a story about a popsicle. Everybody will remember the popsicle. You know, if I call you on Wednesday and I say, what was the sermon about? You go, well, there was a little kid with a popsicle and, a, and he blew the dry. I remember that, you know. I understand. I'm with you. ADHD, all those things, they're all here. All flying around up there. But in the Jewish tradition, there are three main events, according to my professors. The exodus from Egypt, the exile when they were conquered and put into exile and by the Babylonians and the Assyrians and others, and the destruction of the temple, the final destruction of the temple. You know, if you know Jewish history, you know the temple has a has a troubled history. It was it was destroyed and, and torn asunder more than once. But when the Romans came in and did it in 70 AD, they did it. I and mean, it was nothing. So there, in their history, they say there's three main theological, religious things in our history. The exodus, the exile, and the destruction of the great, beautiful, magnificent temple to God. Well, what about our Christian tradition? What main things jump out for us. Well, I think most people would say, if I said, list them for me, what are they? They would get the birth of Christ, obviously. That is one of our main events, so to speak. And for us, it's the one we celebrate the most earnestly. The second thing would be the resurrection of Christ which includes the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ because that was where we received the gift of forgiveness forever for all of our sins. 
So the gift of the Christ child, the gift of the resurrection, and I think most people would agree that the third thing in our Christian history was the day of Pentecost. And that's why I say because this, this is a powerful, never-ending day and event. Just like when we sang the hymn of faith, it is the establishment of a brand new day. The Holy Spirit will come upon anyone who calls upon the name of Jesus Christ. Nobody special. You don't have to be Noah. You don't have to be Abraham. You don't have to be Moses. You can just be you. And if you call on the name of Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's the day of Pentecost all over again. It is a brand new day for you. The gift of the Holy Spirit will be given to you if you seek it and you proclaim Jesus Christ. So for us Christians, it's the birth of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and the fulfilling of the promise that God gave to Christ to give to us that I have a gift of power for you. And people, just as we see in the book of Acts, who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who allow that to happen like Peter did, there is no greater power Peter stood before the Sanhedrin and he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he lectured them. A fisherman lectured these educated men as to the real meaning of the history of the Jewish people and brought it all to illustrate that it had nothing to do with anything except the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. He had more power at that moment. He had no fear in his life at that moment. They could have said, you know, send this man off to the, you know, for him to be crucified. The things that he's said about our history and, and giving all the credit to this man named Jesus, we killed him once. He could have had the same fate. But he was filled with the Holy Spirit, the power, the, the lack of fear in his life, the words that flowed from his mouth were the words given to him by the, the Holy Spirit. And that's what the promise was. I have this thing called the Holy Spirit that I'm going to give to you. And he did on that day of Pentecost. You see, Pentecost, as I hope you are beginning to see, is much more important than the normal level of importance we give to it. We should celebrate Pentecost with the same magnitude that we celebrate Christmas and Easter, the birth and the resurrection of Christ. But we fall a little bit behind on that, a little bit short. Are we tired? Or, or I don't know what's going on. I think we just don't understand how important the idea of the Holy Spirit and the new day, not just for all of humanity, but for each of us as individuals, that it is accessible to us through the gift of the Holy Spirit that was given on that day. You know, we've read this story many times, and I think one year when we had a lot of children, I even made little hats with flames on it, and I had a little electronic flame thing that I lit up on the altar, you know. And we've done everything we could to drive home the idea of this being an important day with illustrations that will help everybody to remember it. But here is what we need to understand. Think of this. The disciples are in a house and they hear a sound. They said it. Not that any of them would know. It sounded like wind from heaven. You could hear it. And, and you know, in the fall, I really love it when the first winds come in in the fall and it's a cool breeze. The leaves are still on the trees and you can actually hear 
the wind moving through the trees. I love that sound. And at that moment, I think, well, maybe this is kind of what it was like on that day of Pentecost in that house, that they heard the wind moving and everybody came to see, well, what is this? Because you have to think back then, as I've talked about how dark it is at night because they didn't have electricity and streetlights, all of the time, unless there was music or a celebration going on, it was quiet at that time. No cars could you hear, no 18-wheelers on the interstate hearing those tires hum, nobody's radio, no lawnmowers going while I'm trying to eat my dinner on the patio. It was quiet. So they could hear that wind. In the community, and they were drawn to it. This is something special going on. And you notice in the scripture this morning, now we make a big deal about talking in tongues, speaking in tongues. And the scripture is a little bit ambivalent. It talks about the disciples being able to speak in these other languages, but it gives equal time to the idea that all of these men, these Jews who came, what they said was, we hear them speaking in our language. So where was the, God, the hand of God? Was it on the disciples and, and so that they could speak all these different languages? Or was it upon all of the crowd that was gathered that they could hear it in their own home language? Not that that's that important, but... What follows that is important. The disciples who Jesus already said, you're going to be my witnesses in the entire world. They were speaking in other languages. People were hearing in other languages. What were they hearing? The magnificent acts of God. You know, this transition took place. They weren't talking about being Israelites. They weren't talking about the, the nation of Israel or, or anything like that. That was gone from their minds at this moment because the Holy Spirit had taken control. And they were speaking, they were witnessing to the magnificent works of God. And these Jewish men could hear it and understand it. And if we read far enough, which we're not going to today, 3,000 people joined the church, the movement, joined Jesus on that day. 3,000. I still compare that to my first day at Carson High School when we were in the gym, and they said there are 3,212 of you. And it filled up the place. And I'm thinking, on this day, that many people came to Jesus. And they also received the gift of the Holy Spirit. We don't make much of a deal of that. Not only were the disciples blessed with it, but all those who heard the magnificent acts of God and understood that this was, as Peter goes on in his speech, this was about Jesus. They became believers. They already believed in God, but now they were believers in God's Son. God had made available at this time to all people, men, women, young, old, slaves. He made available to them the Holy Spirit and the ability to prophesy, or as Jesus said, to witness to the truth of salvation. To God's plan. I think it's interesting. Every time. I'm not sure. Exactly why this is in the scriptures. So many times. But it is driven home. You notice he says. That there were those who believed. That something special was happening. But then there were those. Naysayers. These guys have been into the wine since 6 a.m. when they got up. And they've had too much. That's all that's going on here. Anybody that could hear that wind, and it's just like when Moses came down from the mountain, there's a special look to you when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, 
when God is present with you. So they heard that mighty wind. They saw these men filled with the Holy Spirit, and yet they were naysayers. All this is is a bunch of drunk men at 9 o'clock in the morning on Pentecost. Yoo-hoo! That was all they saw. But the reality of it is that those naysayers had done two things. They closed their heart and they hardened their heart. Now I've said before, God's very clear about this. You want to close your heart and harden your heart? Fine. I'm not going to open that door for you. I'm going to give you all the stimulus I can so that you don't want to do that. But if you decide to do that, go for it. So in every one of these magnificent events in the New Testament, there's always someone or a group of people that are those naysayers with closed hearts, closed minds, and hardened hearts. Well, I hope you can see now that Pentecost, just as is described at the second coming of Christ as a great and remarkable day, The scripture says that closes with that. Joel says that, the prophet Joel. A great and remarkable day is coming. Jesus will return. But Pentecost is a great and remarkable day. Because just as when Jesus was on his way to the cross, just as it says in the book of Revelation, I'm going to make all things new. Pentecost was about making you knew, giving you that second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, or tenth chance to make new, to see a new day, to live in a new day. And I love the way that it wraps up. Because Jesus, when he talked about the end times, when he talked about my coming back, he says, all those, who at that moment call on my name will be saved. And that's how we end this scripture this morning. All those who call on my name will be saved. Now you can, if you want, wait until Jesus returns, as it says in the scripture, on the clouds as he went, as he ascended. You can wait for that day if you want. But you'll miss all of the blessings between today and that day. So the emphasis has to be, you proclaim, you call on the name of Jesus. When? Today. Your day of personal Pentecost. And you will receive the Holy Spirit. You will receive eternal forgiveness salvation for your soul as your blessing if you will just as Jesus implemented Pentecost for the Christians seize that moment make it your new day talk to God tell him what's in your heart call on the name of Jesus and celebrate Pentecost properly let us pray Heavenly Father, we we know that your Son made all things different, all things new, all things better. We know that you make good come from all things. And sometimes we're still hesitant. I can't explain it. I don't understand it. But I ask today, mighty God, for your Holy Spirit to be with us. And reach into the hearts of all of these people. As was written in Psalm 139. To search the hearts of all these people. And whatever it is there. Take it out, Heavenly Father. Make it new. And commit them to your Son, Jesus Christ, in his glory. And it is in his name today we celebrate and we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn today, hymn of invitation, if you feel like you would like to come up and say, this is my Pentecost, I'm ready to call on the name of Jesus, I'm ready to receive the Holy Spirit into my life, I invite you to come forward as we sing number 252, Sweet, 
sweet spirit as our closing hymn today. Please stand. Thank you.